First through four, after a healthy soaking over the weekend, we've got even more rain today and could see even more for Election Day. We'll look at your primary forecast coming up. Karen? All right, Ben. Also, we just got the daily update on coronavirus cases in Michigan, plus a new report on the health of Lions quarterback Matthew Stafford and what the team is saying officially. It's a deportation battle we've been following for years. Now it could be reaching a turning point. We'll explain. Paula. Okay, so what did you do on your COVID vacation? She may just be 11 years old, but wait until you see the incredible feat this young author just achieved. Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Drew. First at four, the number of coronavirus cases in Michigan goes up and the pandemic is affecting Detroit's football and baseball teams. First, the state just announced another 604 new cases in the past 24 hours. Also, we have now recorded six additional deaths. The virus also impacting the Detroit Tigers schedule. Today's game with the St. Louis Cardinals has been postponed after members of the St. Louis organization tested positive. The teams are now hoping to play four games over the next three days, all at Comerica Park. Meantime, Sports Illustrated is reporting that Lions quarterback Matthew Stafford has tested positive for coronavirus. We told you over the weekend he was on the COVID reserve list, but that can mean he's positive or came into close contact with someone who is infected. We did reach out to the Lions. The team tells us it will not comment on the medical status of any player. Governor Whitmer is taking a gamble that now is the time to reopen Detroit's casinos. Today we received a sneak peek at what you'll see if you visit the Motor City Casino. Now none of the local casinos will look like they did before COVID-19 and they're only allowed to reopen at 15% capacity. Visitors will also have temperature checks and will need to follow social distancing. New at 5, Business Editor Rod Maloney will give you more on this tour to show you exactly what you can expect. Motor City Casino will be open in less than 48 hours. It's opening at 10 a.m. on August 5th, which is Wednesday. The Greek Town Casino will open on the same day, but hasn't given a specific time yet. While the MGM Grand is waiting until Friday, August 7th at 10 a.m. A major drug company is moving forward with late phase clinical trials for a COVID-19 antibody treatment. Eli Lilly and company is studying whether its treatment can prevent the spread of the virus in nursing homes among residents and staff. The company is recruiting 2,400 volunteers. Of course, nursing homes have been hit hardest by this pandemic. New at 6, we're going to take a closer look at how the treatment might work and what it means in the overall battle against the coronavirus. Community leaders come together to support a Southgate man fighting a nearly two and a half year deportation battle. This morning, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell joined supporters in front of Central United Methodist Church in Detroit for Deed Ramsborough guy. In 2018, the Albanian immigrant took refuge inside the church so he could continue to care for his wife, Flora, who suffers from multiple sclerosis. While the couple has been in the U.S. for nearly 20 years, his case will be heard on Wednesday in front of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Tomorrow is primary day here in Michigan. Here's a look at the three races that stand out. Oakland County Executive David Coulter is trying to hold on to his office. He took over after the death of L. Brooks Patterson. He's facing a challenge from fellow Democrat and current Oakland County Treasurer Andy Meisner. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib is being challenged by Brenda Jones in Michigan's 13th district. They also face off in 2018, but in a much more crowded field. Moving to Macomb County, three Republicans are fighting to succeed Congressman Paul Mitchell in the 10th district. We'll see who wins among state representative Shane Hernandez, businesswoman Lisa McLean, and retired Air Force Brigadier General Doug Slocum. Of course, the voting process looks very different in 2020 as we all deal with COVID-19. Consumer investigator Hank Winchester is our point person on the explosion in absentee ballots and what you'll see at the polling place. Voting absentee here in the state of Michigan, you are not alone. This is one of the many drop boxes set up all over Metro Detroit. This one in Royal Oak, a steady stream of people making their way here, dropping off their ballots. What do you need to know as we move to tomorrow? Important information, if you are making your way to the polls on Tuesday, I'm going to have everything you need to know, and our coverage begins at 5 o'clock. We're here in Royal Oak. Hank Winchester, help me, Hank. 
All right, remember, Click on Detroit has all the information you need for Election Day. Make sure to look for Decision 2020 section. That's under the News tab. And you can read up on the races, track your absentee ballot, and follow the results tomorrow night and beyond. All right, we're going to get to first weather in just a moment. We got some breaking news just crossing the wires and into our local four newsroom. That baseball series we were talking about between the Tigers and St. Louis, it has officially been canceled the entire series. We're getting word that 13 people in the St. Louis organization now have been tested positive for COVID-19. We'll be following this closely. Again, St. Louis Detroit series now officially canceled. Let's bring in Ben. Let's talk about the forecast and we've got some rain headed our way this afternoon. Yeah, uh, fewer changes than that, Karen. But yes, we do have still more thunderstorms lingering around even after a lot of us got a quite a bit of rain on Sunday. Here's the latest from Storm Tracker 4. All day this stuff has been primarily on the east side. A lot of it now over Lake St. Clair. Just a couple storms uh, still there on the uh, Macomb County line right on the lake shore. But over the last six hours, if we look a little bit further to the north there towards Port Huron, watch how those multiple storms roll through there in a succession of about six hours. Rainfall totals estimated at over three inches. In fact, we got at least one measurement uh, that was over three inches of rain in just a six hour period. Of course, East Aeus has got a lot more rain and that storm could be making landfall in the Carolinas very soon. We'll have more on that as we track it in just a few minutes. Karen. All right. Thank you, Ben. Here's a quick look at the conditions in the Carolinas as Tropical Storm Isaias moves actually towards landfill. The waves in Myrtle Beach are already really high. People have been preparing for the storm for days, but there is a new urgency this afternoon. Swimmers have been told to get out of the water to avoid rough surge and strong rip currents. The storm is expected to gather hurricane strength before making landfall, but hopefully a Category 1. As you know, Ben's always following the latest and will update us in just a few minutes. Millions of unemployed Americans have run out of time and could start running out of money. Extra benefits provided by Congress have stopped and lawmakers are nowhere near a deal for new relief. Local force Kimberly Gill tracking the stalemate and Kim, this could take a while. That's what it sounds like, Karen. Good afternoon to you. We're going to hear from President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in a second, but you'll see there seems to be a huge gap between their priorities as 30 million unemployed Americans wait and wonder what's next. There are many ideas in play here. The White House is seeking another round of $1,200 stimulus payments, although fewer people would receive them. Democrats want to restart that $600 in unemployment benefits, but Republicans want to cut that benefit to encourage people to return to work. Overall, the Republican bill cuts uh, costs about $1 trillion, while the Democrats want to spend $3 trillion. The Democratic plan includes $1 trillion to help state and local governments, and that seems to be a sticking point for President Trump. Listen. They want to bail out cities and states. They want bailout money. They want a $1 trillion in bailout money. And a lot of people don't want to do that because we don't think it's right. They're so fussy about uh, any anecdotal information they may have about somebody not going to work because they make $600 on this, but so cavalier about big money going to uh, uh, companies that really shouldn't be having it. That doesn't sound like they're at all moving toward a compromise, but the House is actually in recess and they won't return to Washington until there's something in which to vote. So, Karen, we will keep you posted as negotiations continue. Until then, we'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Well, during our COVID-19 lockdowns, many of us have tried to pick up some new hobbies, maybe learn a new skill. But can you imagine writing an entire book? A local 11-year-old did just that. Paula Tutman shows us how the story grew and grew and introduces us to two very proud parents. Snow covered the ground as thunder pounded the sky. Suddenly, a flash of fire blazed the ground. When asked what she did during her COVIDcation, two more wolves appeared behind her. The first wolf was unusually blue with white eyes. The second wolf was orange with solid green eyes and flame like ears. 11 year old Nicole Barksdale will be able to say, I finished writing my first great all-American novel. The soon-to-be middle schooler developed a love of all things wolves. Some people think that wolves are savages, don't care, like only care about themselves, but they have the same problems that we do. They have families and beliefs. And in the book, like in the books that I'll be writing, they had the problem of making decisions that changed the lives of others. She did her research, listened to that creative voice inside of her, took a look at what was happening around her in her world, and wrote, just wrote. 
I got a lot of inspiration from the camping trip. We added a lot of stuff, like sicknesses and herbs and names, stuff like that. I think I know my daughter pretty well, but when I started reading her words on paper, I was just like, okay, it's it's giving me insights to what's what she's thinking about, what's in her mind. As she said, a lot of the references she made to the book are kind of um, coinciding with what we're going through right now. I never really thought about it up until now, about how wolves, what wolves believed in, what wolves what do they tell stories or their legends that are passed down from generations of wolves? I'm, I'm extremely proud of her. I'm actually an educator in Pontiac. Um, I come from a, a family of educators. Um, so I'm used to seeing children uh, reading and writing, but with Nicole, it's constantly, every time I look to see what she's doing, she's, she's reading, writing, and drawing. Um, so this is a very strong point for her. Fangs of Fury, The Fallen Light is a fantasy yarn for teens and older. Nicole is both author and illustrator, and if the story doesn't bring you to tears or just the sheer accomplishment of a child so young, simply watch the reaction of a proud mother and know your heart will be moved. And you can find Nicole's book on Amazon.com, and I hope you'll support this brilliant young author, and I hope she remembers us when. Paula Tutman, Local 4. By the way, Nicola is not done. She says, feel free to get hooked on the characters because she plans a whole series of novels. Still had first at four, the oldest retailer in America joins the list of troubled companies pushed into bankruptcy. Talk about what it's hoping will happen next. Also, is the clock ticking on TikTok? President Trump has been threatening to ban the popular app. We're going to take a look at where things stand this afternoon. Up first, the emotional plea from a grieving mother who says people in her line of work need more protection. My family has experienced